Okay. Um, well, I think you'll all agree that we've had some really great uh, sessions so far already. And um, in welcoming you to our second Historical Materialism Conference, I'd like to first of all acknowledge that we're here on the, on the land of the Gadigal people, that you're a nation. And that we hope that part of what will come out of what we're doing here together is going to be of some use to um, a better future for Australia and for Indigenous people in particular. Um, I'm very, I won't talk too long. And I, one thing I do want to say before we go on is that the drinks are going to be Edinburgh Castle Hotel. So <laughs> just let me get that out there. Um, but I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce you to our, our keynote speaker, Warren Monte, who is the author of, several, of numerous books and articles um, that have been major interventions in their field. From his book of t t almost 20 years ago now on Jonathan Swift, through his studies of Spinoza from you know, the late 80s through the 90s to now, he just um, yesterday was speaking at the Univers University of Wales and this conference on Spinoza and ge genealogy of the political community. We actually have people from the University of New South Wales and the Univ University of Western Sydney to thank for, for a large part of the funding for Warren's visit. Um, so there is these you can collect about, I think, at the State Library on Tuesday. you find out there. Um, and also, in addition to those, his major interventions in Marxist theory, and in particular, uh, the work of Louis Althusser. Uh, including a book of 10 years ago which focused on Althusser's work in literary theory in relation to literature and aesthetics and also a very new book which just came out recently um, which I do have a copy of sorry forgive, please, please forgive my unprofessional uh, attempt at showing this off um, it's called Althusser and his Contemporaries, Philosophy's Perpetual War. And he has just finished a book with Mike Hill on Adam Smith. And what he's presenting today is basically coming out of that project. So uh, without much further rating from me, I'll turn over to Mike. Thank you, uh, David, and thank you. I, I really want to thank the organizers, uh, Jonathan, Rory, Jess, uh, and especially David, for, who has been guiding me around Sydney and uh, giving me moral and every other kind of support. So thank you very much. And I, and I know that there was a little bit of controversy. I'm not going into details, but uh, here I am. In 1886, Anton Menger, an Austrian, I almost said Australian, an Austrian uh, legal scholar and socialist, published The Right to the Whole Produce of Labor. And in German, it's actually uh, The Right to the Whole Produce of Labor in a historical presentation, typically to cut that out. And this was an attempt to make a legal argument for socialism. Menger announced his intention to formulate a set of economic rights that would succeed and complete the political rights, above all that of equality, which had been the, quote, objects of the political agitation of the 17th and 18th centuries, unquote. And we should note his avoidance of the term revolution, which doesn't come up there. He identifies three such economic rights. The laborer's right to the whole produce of his labor and its negative corollary the denial of any right to unearned income, the right to subsistence, and the right to labor, or the right to paid employment. Almost immediately after the publication of his book, there followed a response written by no less than Frederick Engels and Karl Kautsky called Juristen Socialismus, or uh, Jurists Socialism. It's translated as Lawyers Socialism. Obviously, not very famous. They argued against Menger that to remain on the juridical terrain of rights, rechtsbogen, would lead to an impasse. Demands such as the demand for equality, quote, 
lost themselves in irresolvable contradictions as soon as they were formulated juridically in detail, leaving the core of the question, the transformation of the mode of production, more or less untouched." Unquote. The irony, of course, is that 30 years later, in a very different situation, uh, namely the Russian Revolution, Kautsky himself would reverse this uh, critique to say that, uh, in essence, the transformation of the mode of production left the question of rights, quote, more or less untouched. Before we consign Menger to oblivion as a kind of historical oddity, which is in some ways easy, it's a very tempting thing to do, however, we should note that when Ludwig von Mises, the uh, patron saint, we could say that, of market fundamentalism, decided to uh, formulate his critique of socialism, both in the book uh, Socialism but also Human Action, Menger's right to the whole produce of labor was the primary target of his critique. Von Mises was notoriously contemptuous of moral and even legal approaches to the market, the property relations it required, and the necessary inequality it produced, as absolutely irrelevant and perhaps even, as he said, superstitious responses to the market's immutable order and the natural laws that govern it. To pass legislation that attempted to interfere with the market's intricate mechanism for him was like attempting to repeal the law of gravity. Why then would he, uh, von Mises, in the 1920s, in a very different situation, bother to undertake a relatively lengthy critique of a work, uh, and his critique was significantly longer than Engels and Kautsky, a work written in a very different historical conjuncture 30-some years earlier that attempted to define socialism as a matter of right. The answer lies in the specificity of the rights that Menger sought to establish. Engels and Kautsky focused exclusively on what was undoubtedly the weak point of Menger's argument, the laborer's right to the whole produce of labor, a notion which, as Marx had already pointed out in the critique of the Gotha program, could not without great difficulty be disentangled from uh, the terrain sorry, from uh, uh, notions of individual appropriation and thus property historically associated with capitalism. <coughs> von Mises, in contrast, read Menger's proposal as if it were centered on the second of the three rights, which in fact couldn't exist primarily in a formal or abstract realm of legality, but moved from the terrain of law to that of life. The right to existence or subsistence the right to receive the means by which an individual could continue to exist was, properly speaking, unformalizable in that it could not be a right that one possessed but did not exercise and was positioned necessarily outside any law or legality as a whole as its condition of possibility for the very simple reason that a corpse cannot serve as the foundation of right. At least, uh, unless it's a zombie. When Mises understood that this right, the necessarily uh, corporeal form of the right to have rights, is meaningless if it remains at the level of mere legality, something Hannah Arendt could not allow herself to acknowledge, even if her thought points in that direction, and for reasons similar to von Mises. The concept of the right to subsistence was ruinous to the notion of the self-regulating order of the market, operating according to the law of supply and demand and the system of communication. For von Mises, this was a new scientific discovery to which he devoted his career. And for Arendt, on the other side, this is the economic foundation for what she called the truly human condition, marked by a, a liberation from the concerns of merely animal life, such as food, clothing, and shelter, in preference for other higher pursuits. For his part, Menger recognized that while the primacy of the right to subsistence, which requires the surrender of unearned income wherever there exists deprivation and hunger, might for a time prove compatible with the property forms on which the market was based, it would inevitably require the socialization of private property, including the means of production. Menger, of course, did not invent these rights, especially the right to subsistence, which was articulated in Article 21 of the Déclaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen, 
the Declaration of uh, the Rights of Man of the Citizen of 1793, which is drafted under the influence, the direct influence, of the left current of the French Revolution, Les Enragés. And they, uh, in, in Article 21, it says, uh, public aid is a sacred debt. Society owes subsistence to uh, unfortunate citizens either by procuring work for them or by assuring the means of, of existence to those who do not have work." Unquote. This document was widely understood as an attempt to give substance to the declarations of freedom and equality and therefore a recognition that they were limited to a formal or symbolic existence if the real constraints and inequalities of material life remained unchanged. Etienne Balibar's conception of Ega Liberté represents an attempt to draw out all the political and philosophical implications of this particular moment and strain in the French Revolution. But even the program of Les Enragés was rooted in the experience of struggle. It's not something that they came up with on their own. And the struggle in France in the latter half of the 18th century. At the center of the struggle was precisely the notion of a right to the means of subsistence. This struggle shaped the arguments of the French economists, not simply the physiocrats, but uh, others, Turgot and uh, a number of others we're going to talk about, and was further imprinted, not directly, but in the silences of Smith's Wealth of Nations, as well as in some of the more controversial uh, assertions of, of Malthus, who in, uh, published some of these assertions in uh, the third edition, and then withdrew them uh, from subsequent editions, so you have to search very carefully. It is thus thoroughly interwoven with what Marx called the movement of primitive or original accumulation, understood not simply as the violent separation of producers from the means of production, production mythu, but also from the Lebens uh, I'm quoting from uh, the end of Capital, literally the means of life or subsistence. But this is not a question, I mean, I'm not here to give you a, a tour through the 18th century. This is not a question of capitalism's past or even of Marx's interpretation of it. It is a question of the present, our present, when the exposure of life to the imperatives of the so-called market forces and the abandonment of populations to destitution is greater than any other time in the last century, while the power to resist, let alone project an alternative, has been diminished to previously unimaginable levels. It is time for a detour, as Althusser would say, and a genealogical analysis, perhaps, of what uh, Nietzsche, he loved the phrase, uh, the pudenda origo of the unimpeded market. And uh, pudenda origo means shameful or embarrassing <coughs> origin, something that uh, people don't want you to see. If you bring it out, everybody's going to get uncomfortable. So I'm going to bring it up. He won't be uncomfortable. Uh, so uh, it's, it, it's uh, the, the shameful origin, let's call it that, uh, of the unimpeded market is seen in the act simultaneously uh, enunciated as a legal moral principle and as an acknowledgment of natural law, but which is in fact part of the process of expropriation that was, as Marx said, inscribed in history in Zugen von Blut und Feuer, in letters of blood and fire, this is the enunciation of the revocation of the right to subsistence. Nowhere is the shameful origin of the capitalist market more visible, its biopolitical demands more openly displayed than in France in this particular period. By the middle of the 18th century, the question of the poor which had previously been focused on problems of vagrancy and mendicancy, of begging, shifted to the issue of hunger and therefore of life and death. <clears throat> and in turn, the question arose of a, of a right to survive, not merely the right not to be killed unjustly and murdered, either by the state or by individuals, but the right not to be allowed to starve to death, the assurance of which was one of the primary justifications both of the state's very existence and of the individual's subjection to it. It was certainly not the case that because the operation of the market was declared to be 
the only rational and effective means of distributing subsistence, any action by the state to procure food for a section of the population during times of scarcity and famine is simply forsworn. The assertion of the market's natural social order in the period before the French Revolution, in fact, granted a formal, even quasi-legal existence to the assumption grounded more in custom than in Christian theology, that the state was responsible for assuring that living individuals were able to persist in their existence, transforming it into a question, if not a fact, of the individual's legal right, which in a sense codified what had remained more or less assumed, and often, as in the case of the English poor laws, not very clearly. But this codification initially took the form of a right that was lifted out of the murky realm of custom and endowed with a formal existence only so that it could be revoked, as if it were an implicit demand, never legally sanctioned, that could be refused only when it was explicitly articulated by those with the power to determine its legitimacy. Moreover, the right to existence or subsistence, or rather to distinguish it clearly from Locke's notion of the individual's right to the life of which he is the sole proprietor, that is, the right to be assured of the means of subsistence, emerged as such not in the great texts of 18th century political thought, obviously, but in the works of economists, many of whom uh, are hardly ever read. Okay. Especially economists in France, and I'm going to look at a particular debate, who with admirable honesty confronted some of the more troubling aspects of the unlimited freedom of commerce, as they called it, particularly commerce in what was then called subsistence, subsistence uh, crops. One question in particular emerged as a kind of battlefield, especially in the face of the repeated subsistence crises in France between the years 1754 in 1774, when there was constant experimentation with free market uh, forms in, in, in agriculture. On the one side, and then 1774 to 1775, when the threat of ungovernable protest forced a return to price and supply regulations, on which the exponents of the unrestricted market determined to oppose any obstacle to its operation, clashed spectacularly with those who sought precisely to impose life, human life, as its necessary foundation, but also its limit. For the former, the discovery of the market's natural order, that is an order necessarily independent of any political intervention, except that of preventing political intervention, compelled them to confront the following question. If, as custom seemed to dictate, the state could not legitimately permit even the slow starvation and decline, not necessarily the death, of a part of the population, understood as possessors of a legal right to their existence, how could it assure their subsistence without damaging through artificial lowering of prices, raising of wages, or simply the requisition of grain, in the case of a terrible famine, that could only ruin merchants and drive them from the trade, the very system of production and distribution that alone to guarantee subsistence to the population. It's a, a conundrum we're all very familiar with. You can call it a Greece. And see it's a, right. Would not any governmental measure designed to provide sustenance to the starving, other than allowing the market to do so according to the means and at the pace proper to its mechanisms, simply postpone and in postponing aggravate the subsistence crisis such measures were intended to alleviate? And Adam Smith. These and other related questions compelled both the proponents of free commerce in food and their opponents to stake out a position relative to the legal right to existence. Their positions were often expressed with great subtlety. Rather than offer a direct critique or defense of this right, they often reformulated it in a way that either broadened its claims upon the sovereign power or in opposition emptied it of any but a formal or abstract significance subordinating, whether implicitly or explicitly, the individual's right to exist to the ability of the market to produce a supply sufficient to meet the needs of the population, of course, as long as it could pay market prices. These questions, which emerged in their modern form for perhaps the first time in France over the period that immediately preceded uh, the wealth of the nations, of course, were no more at the center of the discussions of the freedom of commerce and security of private property then 
than they are now. In fact, it took the opponents of this freedom, some of whom I'm going to, I have to leave out a whole bunch of uh, figures, but the one that I'm going to talk about is, is uh, regarded, not incorrectly, as a quote unquote conservative, a paternalist, and it's a, he's a very complicated figure. And we can say that he was initially, his name is Galliani, I'll talk about him. He was initially uh, very enthusiastic about free market experiments, was as a local administrator in Italy, uh, in charge of one. There was an enormous famine and a catastrophe, and he withdrew uh, bewildered and, and uh, very upset. And, and he's going to be an important uh, figure in this. Um, it took the opponents of this freedom to show that those who sought to impose the rigors of an unrestricted market in grains that would not bear intrusion into the concatenation of intricate but necessary mechanisms of its growth, not simply on a state accustomed to regulating aspects of economic life, but even more importantly on a people in France always ready to revolt and whose uprisings the state traditionally would take any measures to avoid had already proposed answers to a question their opponents would or perhaps could not directly pose. I want to begin with, not with the more well-known figures in the French economy, Quenet uh, or Turgot, but with the considerably less familiar figure of Claude Jacques Herbert, whose essay, um, sorry, his book called An Essay on the General Policing of Grain, uh, appeared in 1755. Adam Smith uh, was very influenced by him. He cites him directly in The Wealth of Nations and has very, very high praise for Herbert. Writing in support of the liberalization of commerce and grain, Herbert cautions the reader to keep in mind, quote, that sometimes the suffering of the people is needed to achieve the common good. I think we've heard that. <laughs> it's very uh, original. But as an admittedly small number of his contemporaries asked, what exactly is the meaning of suffering in this passage? If it is hunger, how long and to what degree must or indeed can the people suffer and what negative effects both for but perhaps even more importantly from the people will this suffering provoke? I mean, the interesting thing, Did you read the French uh, economic writing as opposed to the English? Is to see a constant fear of the masses. It's there in every single statement. Uh, in in, in uh, Smith, it's there, it's hidden in certain ways. But in the, Fr in the French, they're very, very open about it. If, we, if we, we're not really careful, there's going to be an explosion, of course. What happened? There was an explosion. <coughs> stupid. Okay. Um, these questions were posed not only by those motivated by morality or religion, to whom it had never occurred that a government would simply allow such suffering. They were also asked by those who thought Herbert naive and foolish. How long will the people endure this before they revolt? Anticipating these responses, Herbert argues that his goal is precisely to assure the means of subsistence of the entire population of France, but for, the, for more than two centuries, the measures taken to ensure food for the people have instead worked to bring about the very crises they were intended to prevent. Price controls designed to make food available at below market prices, when the prices went up, produce losses and eventual ruin for the merchants, he tells us. While public granaries, where emergency supplies could be stored in, in case of a particularly bad harvest, were attended with, quote, numberless inconveniencies, and I'm still quoting, it is from the freedom of commerce alone that one can expect the storage of grain at the least cost and of the greatest utility to the people's subsistence. Further, the very idea of food shortage, or uh, as it was called in English in the 18th century, dearth, that's a word that Smith uses in uh, digression of the corn trade, and in French, disette, is an illusion created by a combination of ignorance and fear among the peasantry and a desire on the part of the state both to control France's economic life and to appear bountiful and solicitous of its people. So the idea of shortage is an illusion. There's no shortage. There's some kind of uh, panic and rational fear 
The slightest fluctuation in the price of grain, he tells us, is enough to set off a panic. The most fleeting effects of supply and demand immediately produce an unholy alliance of the people and their governors for whom any rise in the price of grain can only be the consequence of monopoly and hoarding. And if those of you who know Adam Smith, these are the arguments that he reproduces practically verbatim. The argument was taken further by Louis Paul Abbe, who's a, a, a protege, in the 1760s. In a nation capable of feeding itself, and which often produces a surplus, he asked, how are real, he underscores real, real shortages even possible, except perhaps in the very rare case of a catastrophically bad, as opposed to a merely disappointing harvest. The increasingly frequent phenomenon merely mistakenly referred to as shortage is in fact merely an apparent or artificial shortage caused not by any genuine lack of grain, but by the irrational pass passions of, his word, the multitude, encouraged, if not created, by the philosophy underlying state regulations. Abe insists that it is no more reasonable to complain that grain is too expensive than that it is too cheap. The very notion of too expensive, meaning, according to him, nothing more than the price is more than the people underscore want to pay, inevitably gives rise to demands for state intervention, thus creating an obstacle to free commerce. A significant increase in price causes a general alarm, he says, and among the, the petit peuple, the, the little people, panic. Quote, fear so contagious by itself becomes still more so when it is expressed in shouts. The contagion spreads, and the state, out of fear of peasant revolt and urban riot, initiates artificial measures to lower the price of grain without regard to market conditions or proprietary right. Quote, those to whom the grain does not belong propose to force the proprietors to sell it at the same price as during times of abundance, unquote. If the proprietors refuse to allow this violation of their property rights, rights and, quote, take precautions to protect their grain from the invasion <coughs> with which they are threatened, if I can see that they, they uh, hide their stores of grain. They are denounced as criminals by the rapidly mobilizing population, whose outrage both frightens the state and determines its policy. Such merchants, Abe is very upset, are regarded as little more than thieves who have stolen grain, that the people are convinced somehow irrationally belongs to them. Thus, quote, violence is converted into right and need takes precedence over property, unquote. The result is that the lowering of prices by the decree of the government, acting itself, not uh, out of its own initiative, but at the behest of an indignant multitude, allows an amount of grain that a high price would make suffice for three months to be purchased and consumed within a month, causing calamity. Again, Adam Smith practically verbatim. This is the reality concealed by the illusion of fair price, just price, etc., as if price is determined, Abe says, by the people's need, real or imagined, rather than the relation of supply and demand. The people cry, quote, the government is responsible for guaranteeing me bread at, the, uh, at a cheap rate, unquote, arrogating to themselves the right to legal protection from an increase in the price of grain. Abe is deeply concerned. Even if we grant that the demand for bread is motivated by actual need rather than preference, and that a rise of price might place it beyond uh, the reach of a part of the population, quote, can one imagine without terror where one would quickly and immediately have placed oneself if it was admitted that need has a title superior to that of property? Would, uh, what then would be the meaning in our language of the words right, property, and security, or even the words authority and administration, unquote. Abe insists that the government must recognize that although it is true that the people cannot always afford the price of grain, to respond to this need by attacking the right of property and the security necessary to the operation of the market will only aggravate an already desperate situation. The proper action of government in such cases, he argues, is a deliberate refraining from action. Even in the face of violent protest, the very famous phrase, it must laisser agir, let it act as it will. That is, allow the appropriate price of grain at any given moment. 
Now, Foucault, uh, who in sea purity territory population, has a discussion about bay, uh, which is quite interesting, uh, remarks that by letting prices rise as they will, there were no longer, according to Abbe, there will no longer be, quote, scarcity in general on the condition that for a whole series of people, in a whole series of uh, markets in France, there will be some scarcity, some uh, dearness, uh, high prices, some difficulty in buying wheat, and consequently some hunger, this is Foucault's tool. And it may well be, yeah, that some people are going to die of hunger. Okay? But by letting these people die, by letting them die of hunger, and then the verb is laisser mourir, by letting them die, one will be able to make scarcity a chimera, a illusion, <coughs> and prevent it from occurring in this massive form of catastrophe typical of the previous systems. Foucault suggests here that death by starvation must be allowed not to disappear, must not be prevented if it is a function of market price, but permitted precisely to perform its function in the sequence of causes that will determine that no shortage becomes uh, a catastrophic, because you have a whole scale of famines, etc. catastrophic famine. In the silences and ellipses of these urgent declarations of faith by the partisans of the free market, who feared that the very conditions under which the unlimited freedom of commerce was the most necessary were those that would create the greatest resistance to their proposals, both from above and from below. A certain question took shape to which understandably few of these otherwise very intrepid authors would respond directly. The question is this. If a government must act by refraining from action in order precisely to allow food supplies to increase, must the imperative laisser agir, laisser faire, also mean that a government can or even must laisser mourir, that is, allow those who without start state intervention uh, will starve to do so. It would be a mistake to think that these positions, which are very important, uh, and, and many officials were being one to these, but it would be a mistake to think that these positions went unchallenged or were challenged only by state functionaries who, motivated by self-interest or a commitment to mercantilism, could only respond by defending the existing policies. In fact, no response was more effective, and, and still today, more ignored and marginalized than that of Abbe Galliani, the Italian prelate, whose uh, dialogues on the commerce in wheat, 1770, provoked a furious reaction from the advocates of the unrelated, un unrelegated unregulated, there we go, market. Although often dismissed today as a text of wit and refinement, but not theoretically interesting, uh, Galliani's dialogue succeeds both in bringing to light some of the guiding but unstated assumptions of the liberals and in demonstrating the concrete and quite predictable effects of the proposed reforms omitted from their text. Referring not to authors, but to doctrines and ideas, Galliani confronts the position articulated by Abbe, among others, that need, this one, cannot be allowed to take precedence over property right, even if the need in question is the need for food, itself necessary for mere survival. The position in question is not a Lockean defense of a natural right donated to the individual by God, and indivisible from his own person, which even the poor man Owns, right? uh, it is instead a defense according to which private property, distinct from the proprietor's own person, but legally at the disposal of and directed by the will of the individual proprietor alone, is necessary to the operation of the market, which is itself the only rational means by which even, or perhaps especially, a commodity like food can be effectively distributed. Thus, dis despite the economist's expression of concern for the injustices suffered by grain merchants during times of hunger and scarcity, it increasingly appears that the right of property is less a matter of what should be for them than of what must be if societies are able to endure as society, not on the individual level, let alone prosper. 
Galliani responds that behind supply and demand, and the latter understood not simply as preference, demand not simply as preference, but more importantly as the ability to pay for what one wants, is the irreducible physical need for nourishment, a need all the more pressing when it cannot take the form of market demand. That is, when human, the human individual cannot afford to exist, that allows him to begin, Gagliani, his interrogation of the doctrine of free commerce and grain. Even as grain is a product sold on the market, it is also, unlike nearly any other crop produced in Europe, a matter of physical necessity and therefore the central concern of any civil order. As such, unlike other commodities, grain, he says, is a political matter, not an economic matter. Quote, and once provisioning becomes a matter of politics, it ceases to be an object of commerce. Unquote. Political acts such as deregulating the grain trade, Galliani argues, must be judged by their effects. Against the notion that there is an irreversible march or natural progress towards allowing markets to set prices and determine the availability of food, Galliani asks the dialogue, he asks his uh, interlocutor, do you believe that being able to afford food is going to go out of fashion someday? It is in the sixth dialogue that Galliani takes up the question of commerce and grain in specificity and most openly confronts the stated and unstated assumptions guiding the liberals. He begins by defining commerce in a general sense, which is very tricky, very interesting, as the exchange of the superfluous for the necessary thereby substituting the terms superfluous for supply and necessary for demand. In this way, commerce, above all commerce and grain, cannot be separated from the question of the needs of the population. A commodity is never simply a supply, a given quantity without reference to the population that produces and consumes it. On the contrary, it exists as a supply only to the extent that it exceeds not the demand of a population able to purchase what it requires, but rather the physical need of that population, a need that high prices, for example, may make it impossible for the people to meet. Grain or wheat can in fact never be superfluous. It is, quote, after the elements, the greatest, most pressing, and continuous of man's needs, unquote. Just as elements, he tells us, like water, equally necessary to human life, can never be the object of commerce. Eh? How naive he was. Right? <laughs> But he couldn't imagine that water would be bought and sold on the market. Uh, okay. uh, as, and he actually says, as if a nation could trade away its water supplies. They were very primitive. Uh, the stores of wheat cannot be allowed to be sold abroad, leaving a population vulnerable to the slightest vicissitudes of climate. It can be considered superfluous only from the point of view of an individual proprietor or producer, but never from, quote, the entire, the perspective of the entire French empire. All, and this is a very important statement. All the subjects of the same master, he sees the conservative, all the children of this good father, he's not talking about God, he's talking about the king, okay, have an equal right to be guaranteed food. Un droit égal à être assuré de leur nourriture. It is this necessary right to food, a right coextensive with exi existence itself, which accordingly must be understood as the actual capacity to obtain and consume food, not simply the right to supply of food theoretically, but not in fact available to the people, that distinguishes food <coughs> from other commodities. And he gives the example of shoes. One can go without shoes. One can repair them. Uh, one can make crude sandals or sabots, the wooden uh, shoes out of, out of wood. But one cannot go more than a few days without being severely weakened by the absence, absence of nourishment. Quote, can you make a pound of bread last 20 days in, in your house? Unquote. He does not dispute, for example, that the high price of food during a dearth of disette will likely attract grain merchants from other provinces and maybe other nations because they're seeking profit. And then after some interval, quote, equilibrium will be restored. But, he asks, what if this interval is too long and equilibrium, equilibrium arrives too late when people have already died of hunger, unquote. By insisting on the existence of an interval, which is not that which changes the relation of supply to demand, but rather that which separates food 
from those who cannot afford to, to purchase the quantity necessary to that, their existence, that is, those whose need, however urgent, does not qualify as demand, that Galliani makes visible what would otherwise be outside of and invisible to the market. And it is here, in this interval or opening, that we can begin to see the relation of the unrestricted market in grain to life and to death. But Galliani does not insist on the extreme case of famine. He's one of the very few, maybe the only one, in this entire debate, which is a huge debate, I can't believe it, to ask, what does it mean for a family to go days without food while waiting for the equilibrium of the market to be restored, or to make a week's provisions last for two in the face of high prices. And I, I don't have time to go through the whole thing about this, but again, if, if we go to Adam Smith, he is, is precisely a proponent of, of this idea that there's almost an infinite capacity to divide food into ever smaller units in the, in the case of scarcity, and people will somehow be able to survive. Also very interesting, Turgot, who was a free market proponent, scolded David Hume, who made a similar argument in the letter, and said, I'm sorry, you try living on uh, a pound of bread for two weeks, and you know, uh, it's, it's crazy, Hume, you're, you're losing your mind. And I made no joke. So, uh, he was one of the few to, uh, to, to use the term malnourished, Galliani, and to point out the greater susceptibility to disease that prolonged malnutrition inevitably produces. Absolute freedom of commerce and grain without public granaries that were considered so costly to taxpayers and injurious to the operation of the market can assure nothing more than sooner or later, after an interval whose duration cannot be determined in advance, grain will arrive where it is not to be found, where the prices will fall over time, where it exists in short supply and priced out of reach. To establish by law commerce without restriction of any kind in what is necessary to the people's survival, that is, through legal action to place food beyond the reach of law and a political decision, even in the name of the abundance to come, is to renounce any guarantee of the subsistence of the population, especially insofar as such a guarantee could only interfere with the market. It is precisely in order to make dearth and malnourishment, sorry, death and malnourishment visible that Galliani insists on a right proper to the individual considered as a subject to subsistence, as if the subject were the living substrate, which is the Greek uh, subject, on the basis of which alone something like <coughs> subjection to the sovereign is possible. Obedience to sovereign authority is predicated on that authority's ability to guarantee existence. The reformers have, have proposed, he says, to annul any such guarantee. In this sense, to abandon price controls, regulation, public granaries, is to abandon the subjects themselves to whatever provision the market makes with its intervals, its interstices, its bottlenecks, its crises of over and under production. It is to call upon these subjects to accept or be compelled by force to accept their own deprivation as the necessary means to the market's equilibrium. Galliani makes visible the contradiction that haunts this doctrine. The right to be guaranteed subsistence, that is, to be able to continue to live, is different from other rights. It is the very possibility that there exists someone to be endowed with rights, and is therefore the foundation of even the right to subject oneself to the sovereign. If the sovereign refuses such a guarantee by allowing the market to act upon the subject without restriction, and if they are not killed as, a, as punishment for criminal acts, but abandoned by legal decision and allowed to die, or even merely exposed to the threat of death by hunger and malnutrition, not only without any guarantee of aid, but on the contrary, guaranteed that no such aid will be provided for them, and told that they must wait for the invisible hand to provide for them as it will, is not, as uh, Ariani asked, the tie of subjection broken. And if this is the case, if the people have been abandoned by law, by what right does the government command their obedience? Even more seriously, on what legal and political grounds can it condemn those whose uprising, riots, and seditious assemblies demand nothing more than the people's subsistence, itself the ground of any... Oh. <coughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> no. okay. Okay. We can have a negotiation. Anyways, 
Uh, Galliani's arguments, uh, questions, his assistance on the, the primacy of the anatomical facts of the human body over questions of legality or even mathematical <coughs> questions made the question of subsistence a political rather than economic matter, precisely the fundamental political matter, the basis of law and life, and posed enormous challenges, as a very powerful argument, to his critics. And of the challenges, none was more vexing than the assertion of an equal right to be guaranteed food. And this right struck everybody who wanted to like it as nearly incontrovertible, but at the same time ruinous to the very idea of the market's natural order. Perhaps only a conservative, quote unquote, like Gaviani, could risk proposing a right that by de definition could not be confined to a merely formal existence guaranteed in law, even if material conditions enabled only some while preventing many from exercising it, as in the case of the famous freedoms enshrined in the great 18th century constitutions. The right to be guaranteed food, on the contrary, was a right whose fulfillment lay in its realization. It exists only as a right if people have food. Even more, the demand for equal provisioning is only in part aimed at the state. It is also a demand to reject and overcome the unequal distribution of food according to price by the market itself, whose partisans could no longer invoke the adequate supply that is provided without concerning themselves with the question of whether or not people actually have enough to eat. According to Galliani's formulation, if the people do not in fact consume sufficient food, what is theirs by right has been denied them, and the legitimacy of the political order upon whose, uh, whose use of force, the operation of the market, and the very existence of the private property that is its foundation is called into question. And Marx said uh, 80 years later, the ruling class that cannot guarantee the existence of its population is unfit to rule. In response, and there are many responses, I have to uh, only focus on one that's very interesting, it's the most interesting. Uh, the physiocrat, which is one of the schools of economics, Abbe and the third priest, Abbe Rougo in 1770, drew from uh, uh, Abbe's comments to launch an assault on the very notion of a right to be guaranteed food. So this is a counterattack. His tone is one of outrage. The mere fact, he tells us, that people need food does not give them a right to it. Is not all food already the legitimate possession of proprietors whose right would be violated if they were compelled to surrender to others who merely require it but have no legal claim to it. The erroneous association of subsistence needs with right, and a right to the means of subsistence, without any regard to proprietary status, has in fact brought about, he tells us, a general inflation of the very notion of right. It's expanding its realm by multiplying individual rights without regard to consistency, because you have a right to existence, right to property, which is it? There now exists, he says, an incoherent, quote, excess of rights which in fact functions as a prohibition on the right of property. Property, if it is to be more than merely what happens to be in a person's possession uh, at a given moment, and which, if it is to be, uh, if it is more necessary to another, may be legitimately transferred to him with or without the holder's agreement, cannot simply be the object of one right among so many others, he says. It must carry with it, that is the right to property, quote, immunity, the necessary complement of liberty. Above all, the liberty to dispose of one's property as one see fit. Merchants, for example, are often the object of popular opprobrium, as if by merely owning the nation's grain supply and by rightfully keeping it in their possession, distributing it when they alone see fit, irrespective of the needs, real or imagined, of those around them, they were guilty of a crime, theft, or extortion, even at the extreme, he says, if some unfortunate should happen to die of starvation, murder. Quote, the merchant does not steal, he buys. And what he has paid for belongs to him. To the extent that he sells, he feeds men and murders no one. To the extent that he buys, he collects food for the places where it is needed, and he is the happy supplier of those who would otherwise die of hunger without his aid and service. He is neither thief nor murderer, and is in a sense the savior and nourisher of peoples. If it should come to pass that there are unfortunates unable to buy their food, 
it is nevertheless not permitted to take food from him, or even force him to sell it at a certain price. For it is his possession, he owes it to no one, and if he is not the master who decides what is to be done with it, he will abandon a business so useful to others, but so onerous to him. Let us leave to the side for the moment the now familiar argument that without absolute property, there can be no commerce, competition, etc. What is striking in this passage is the legal and political admonition. If it comes to pass, as it may, as it will, that there are persons whose number as a percentage of the population is irrelevant to the argument at hand, who for whatever reason are unable to buy the food that the merchant owns, it is not the merchant's duty or responsibility to provide them with what is necessarily, what is nevertheless necessary to their existence, and no third party, not even the state, which on the contrary should indemnify him, he says, can in justice ask him to do so. Roubault calls these uh, unfortunate individuals les malheureux, the, the unfortunate ones, and they are indeed unfortunate, given that they are starving. But their very inability to pay for their subsistence is construed in this passage as a demand. The mere presence of the many who cannot buy what they must have to live is experienced as a kind of threat to the merchants and their property. Their hunger, the immediate threat to their life, otherwise so compelling, is explicitly ruled out as a justification for requisitioning the food that belongs to the merchants, or even enforcing them simply to sell their stock at lower prices. Merchants, grain merchants, precisely in order to fulfill their function as provisioners of the nation, must enjoy a freedom that takes the form of immunity from any obligation to recognize or respect a general right to existence. Those who oppose this, quote, freedom or immunity, unquote, whether out of the fear of the multitude or pity for the hungry, are in fact, quote, enemies of the public good, unquote, preventing the amassing of wealth necessary to increase the cultivation and their support the supply of food, the only means to lower prices and feed the people <coughs> as a whole. Others, especially in this time of disette, which uh, Rudeau admits is a, an unfortunate but necessary consequence of liberalization, uh, argued that uh, there needs to be a temporary regime of shared and proportional sacrifice. This is a, an argument sort of a compromise between the free market a temporary regime of shared and proportional sacrifice simply in order to supply the necessities of life to the poor. A sacrifice which, he says, falls particularly on those who alone <coughs> own and control the nation's food supply. But he asked, how can the authorities order sacrifices? Sacrifice is voluntary. It is a relinquishing of right derived from the freedom to use one's own property as, one's, as one will for the advantage of another. It is an act of generosity. And generosity cannot be commanded. Forced sacrifice is therefore an illusory idea, the force which constrains it being the work of tyranny. This is still uh, Hubeau. When you deprive yourself of right over legitimately acquired goods, the enjoyment of which is both new, useful and agreeable in favor of another person, this is sacrifice. If judges issue an order for you to deprive yourself of such goods for the benefit of another who has no legal claim, and then under the pretext that the other needs these things, this would be injustice. The authorities cannot, through regulation, order the proprietor of food to sacrifice any of his rights over this food to satisfy the interests and needs of a third party who has no such rights. The nation's food supply is thus in the hands of those who are precisely exempted from any responsibility for the life and death of their fellows. And so it must be if its benefits are to reach, quote, those who have not yet felt its advantages. Because we are not speaking here of something as vague as poverty or penury, but the need for what is necessary to human survival, the immunity that food merchants enjoy, while not a nullification of the right to exist, okay, um, exempts the merchant from any claims legal or customary based on the right to existence and extends protection precisely to the merchant's goods that alone can give reality to the other's right to live. The grain merchant owes nothing to anyone else, and by his immunity is deprived of any responsibility to their survival, for their survival. The obligation, service, or sacrifice unjustly demanded the merchant for the benefit of uh, l'autrui, the, the other in French, is, as Roberto Esposito reminds us, munus in Latin. 
and communitas, community, is precisely the totality of persons united not by property, but by an obligation or debt. The legitimate proprietor in this case, the proprietor of grain, must be in advance immunized, not relieved of the uh, sacrifice, against the very possibility of an expropriation by means of an imposed sacrifice, and exempted from the burden of the bonds of community, an exemption that leaves those who cannot augment his property abandoned to death by starvation for which he no longer bears responsibility. Through a kind of homeopathy, the proprietors of grain described by Rubeau paradoxically provide for the lives of their fellows only insofar as they are released from any responsibility for their welfare. The universality, or to cite Hegel, the Gemeinheit, actualizing the material form of the market, has thus abolished community, Gemeinschaft, and replaced it with an immunitary regime in which the res propria, property, precedes and makes possible the res publica, public uh, existence, as if a perpetually reasserted absence of, or an, indeed an increasingly violent protection from, the responsibilities of fellowship is all that can determine the individual unwittingly to aid his fellows. And in this way, this very freedom, the freedom that Houdot imagines is coextensive with the proprietor's immunity, is extended in some way to those against whose claims he's immunized, as if there occurs a kind of reciprocal exclusion or the realization of a mutual independency, that is a non-dependence in which the unfortunate individual abandons his claim on the proprietor who has abandoned him. The social relation henceforth is understood as a subtraction, even a despoilation, from which proprietors must be protected by the state. The effects of this protection, however, are far from equal. While the proprietor flourishes and affirms his being by extending the realm of the proprium as far as possible, the non-proprietor of food, protected from himself, from the dependency he would demand that both the state and proprietor recognize is by that fact restored to himself and abandoned to death. There is thus something paradoxical about the revocation of the right to subsistence. It is the revocation of a formal right that did not yet exist, as if the revocation were preemptive, an anticipatory annulment of a right that had made its first appearance in the form of its own denial. Moreover, this revocation, imminent in the system of property production and exchange, precedes law and therefore remains outside its purview. It is the decision more profound than any sovereignty to leave life exposed to death, the command laissez mourir that accompanies laissez faire as its condition. But we should remember that the Latin verb revoco, which uh, uh, before it took on a legal significance of revocation, originally meant to call someone back, and the example given in the dictionary, is calling the actor back to the stage for an encore. The revocation of the right to continue living cannot help but call the living back to the stage, since the survival of so many depends on the power to revoke in practice, rather than in law, the revocation of the right to subsistence itself. Thank you.